afternoon and good evening to everyone who is joining us um, this Wednesday evening here in South Africa. Um, we have lots of people dialing in from around the world. So a good day to you wherever you may be around the world. And thank you for joining us. Um, this is another one of our Wish Wednesdays. In fact, this one is a worldwide wish where we bring a, a local um, speaker and also an international speaker um, to talk to you this evening. Um, as always, uh, we thank you for joining us. We've got lots of um, people from lots of different fields and we thank in particular um, the South African Sports Medicine Association um, for also advertising these webinars for us. At WISH, um, the WITS Sport and Health, we provide these educational um, webinars in a series that has kindly been sponsored by Asino Lita Pharmaceutical Company. So as always, we thank them very much for their uh, continued support. They um, are kindly making this um, possible for us. As always, um, just by way of um, housekeeping, please direct your questions through um, the Q&A tab that you find and we'll give our speakers a chance um, to address those. I see we've already got a question that's come in, so that's fantastic. And after we introduce our speakers, we give them a chance to present, we will start addressing some of those um, questions that have been brought in. So without any further ado, um, let us um, start introducing our speakers to you. Um, the first speaker, or the, I'll, I'm gonna start by introducing the second speaker. Um, and the reason for that is the second speaker um, is joining us from Finland. And if you can just say a quick hello, um, our speaker is Dr. Ben Waller um, from Finland. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much. Nice to be in this lecture. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. And then I will introduce our first speaker. And um, her name is Maria. She can quickly say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so good to see you from South Africa. <laughs> and thank you for joining us, Maria. I'm going to um, introduce Maria a little bit more to you. So Maria Gerondudis um, began her hydrotherapy practice 15 years ago and the pain physiotherapist, Prof Phyllis Berger. And then for 11 years, she headed the hydrotherapy program at the Sports Medicine Center of the Morningside Medi Clinic in Johannesburg under Prof John Patricius, who we all know so well. She has developed both active and passive hydrotherapy techniques, which have been lauded by leading doctors, specialists, researchers and wellness professionals. In 2018, she established a state-of-the-art hydrotherapy facility in Santon, so that patients have access to excellence in both environment and technique for the best possible therapy results. It has raised the bar for hydrotherapy in Southern Africa, with practitioners coming to Johannesburg from across the continent for training. Maria teaches internationally, has presented her work at international and local conferences, and has been published in three healthcare journals. Her maxim is be like water. And we certainly look Absolutely. forward to what Maria has to talk to us about today. So Maria, if you can please start sharing your screen and um, then I will mute myself and stop my video and hand over the reins to you. Thank you so much, Robin. Let's have a look here. Let's go for that. Great. Okay, are screen. we good to go? Yes. Great. Well, it's wonderful to chat to you today and share some of the work that we do. And thank you to the whole WISH team for your hard work to make these webinars possible. They really do share a wealth of knowledge. Um, so today we'll explore hydrotherapy and how it can be used to facilitate recovery in conditions that present symptoms of pain or stiffness or both. Because the term hydrotherapy is an umbrella term that applies to a broad number of treatments that use water as a therapeutic tool. Just for clarity, when we use the term hydrotherapy in rehabilitation, we mean a therapy session in an indoor heated pool where a therapist applies a range of therapeutic exercises and activities. I developed my own technique over a number of years I've called it Geron Hydrotherapy. It uses a tailored therapeutic exercise uh, routine together with Eastern physical therapy techniques, 
myofascial release and deep tissue massage. It takes advantage of the mechanical and thermal properties of warm water to strengthen, stretch, loosen, realign, relax, and release the body in ways that are difficult to achieve on land. It's unique in that it applies specific protocols and techniques that grew organically over the years. And I'm happy to share some of them with you in this presentation. Now, this is a, this is a brief outline of what we will cover. A bit of background on myself and my work. Vitz is my alma mater, but in the arts, not the health sciences. And then in my mid twenties, I was studying a master's of architecture at the University of Michigan. When personal tragedy hit, I lost someone that I loved very dearly. And shortly after I sustained a deep laceration in my calf that physically put me out of action and it really darkened the space that I was in. A good friend suggested that I try hydrotherapy and specifically a form of water shiatsu because she believed it would address more than my physical pain. So the next time I was in London, I booked some treatments with an experienced therapist named Hilary Austin. At the end of my first session, my feet touched the pool floor and I knew that my life would never be the same. I had come home. More importantly, it worked. The darkness wasn't so dark anymore. Recovery on every level happened much faster than I had anticipated. Architecture for me was about solving problems with economy, creativity and balance. But whereas architecture's creative force draws on nature, hydrotherapy's creative force is the powerhouse behind nature. It's the fountain itself. And economy and balance occur by default to solve the problem. So I gave up architecture. I knew that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I followed the path that seemed to organically unfold before me. I trained with Hillary in the UK and continued my hydrotherapy studies first in Holland, then in the US, Brazil, Switzerland, Greece, and Israel, until I had learned all the forms of and techniques of hydrotherapy that were out there. And then I also completed my professional qualification in Shiatsu, which is an ancient form of holistic physical therapy based on traditional Chinese medicine. Then I came across Tom Myers talking about the tensegrity structure of the human body and all my architectural instincts prickled. So off I went to study anatomy trains and myofascial release with him. Many of the stretches and techniques that he used were also used in shiatsu, so it consolidated well with the tools in my toolbox. But the journey was far from over. In 2005, I met Professor Phyllis Berger. She's an established and published acupuncturist and physiotherapist in South Africa, and she specializes in pain management. Her work explored the correlation between the acupuncture meridians and the nervous system. She also had a beautiful indoor therapy pool and she convinced me to move back to South Africa and work in her practice to help her patients with their pain management. And we saw immediate results. Then the renowned sports physician, Professor John Patricius crossed my path and invited me to join the team at Morningside. And for the next 11 years, I had the opportunity to work with incredible professionals, therapists, and many, many patients. This also allowed me to learn from others, try new things, and refine my technique. And then the objectives driving my work are simple. To restore a patient's quality of life in the shortest possible time, as safely as possible, with as little pain and effort as possible, and to sustain well-being for as long as possible. The water is critical in achieving this, and it's far more complex than we think. Just because we're familiar with it doesn't mean we understand it. It's one of the most powerful elements on earth, but it works in the most gentle, supporting, nurturing, profound way to restore wholeness and balance. On a physical level, it balances out rigid with flexible, weak muscle groups with contracted ones, agonist with antagonist, enough but not too much, intensive exercise with intensive rest. 
on a mental and emotional level, it balances out fear and willpower, grief and acceptance, anger and peace, stability and change. These opposites are all at play inside of us, but often we don't know how to integrate them. And especially in chronic pain conditions, the balance tips dangerously to one side and patients get stuck in a very dark place. Stuck and water don't go well together. The more time you spend with water, the more you become like water. Apparently, a student asked Bruce Lee to teach him how to kill a man. He advised him first to go and learn how to heal a man and then he'd teach him how to kill a man. By the time the student had learned the Chinese healing arts, he had no desire to kill anymore. Balance had been restored. And that's why he was so good because he fully understood the relationship and power of mastering opposites. In martial arts, by being like water, you flow, you use your opponent's power against them. Life is not, harming, life is not about harming and water is life. Coming back to the Eastern healing arts, without going into too much detail, I'm going to go through some basics because there are a few concepts about water and the human body that, I, that need to be understood because they're integral to the protocols that I use. When I was learning Shiatsu, I was asked to set aside my scientific understanding of the way that the human body works so that I can grasp the concepts that were being presented, chi and meridians and all the rest of it. And I really didn't like it. I was raised in a Greek household. Science and Aristotelian logic were almost sacred. Was this some kind of ritualistic healing? Is there anything religious about it? Could it be harmful? But I knew from my own experience that it worked and it had been used for millennia. So there has to be something there. So I persevered wanting to understand this ancient art and I'm so glad that I did because the answers to all those questions were no. And actually, you don't need to set aside science to understand these concepts. It's just that those teaching them hadn't set them out in a framework that I was familiar with. They add another layer to what we already know. Um, in fact, empirical science is just catching up. Now we have anatomical evidence of the existence of meridians as part of the human extracellular matrix with fascia being an important part of their substrate. We're discovering new functions of structures like the interstitium, which Eastern medicine have known about for millennia. They just called it the mist under the skin. So here I am, your Greek classicist, reframing the principles for you so that you too can gain some insights into this world. Let's zoom out a bit and take a brief look at ancient Chinese philosophy. We all exist as part of an energy-filled universe. And this concept of energy is no different to our modern understanding of energy, which can neither be created nor destroyed, but transferred or changed from one form to another. For thousands of years, Eastern medicine has studied the dynamics of energy in nature in order to understand how we fit into the universe, how the life force of nature works within us, but more importantly, how to intervene and rectify imbalances in the human body. They observed that living things are different manifestations of the same life force. They called it chi. It's subtle energy that surrounds, permeates, and animates all of life. It then manifests into visible matter operating at all macro and microscopic levels of a physical body. Our body is the densest level of living energetic matter vibrating at a frequency that is both tangible and visible. The whole system operates within a delicate balance. We may use the word homeostasis here. In Chinese, it's yin and yang. According to this ancient principle, the life force has two opposite but complementary qualities. Both are present in different proportions in all living things. Both are needed for well-being. There is a cyclical dynamic between the one and the other. The one contains the seed of the other and they transform into one another, much like the seeds of summer buried underneath the winter snow. In the human body, whole systems 
of opposing but complementary qualities and processes are based on this principle. Yang energy is characterized as active, hot, external, growing, bright, masculine, shifting. It carries the impotence for transformation and movement. Yin energy is passive, dark, quiet, introversive, condensed, feminine, nourishing, cool, internal, and stabilizing. In nature, the element of fire represents the qualities of yang, the element of water represents the qualities of yin, and they maintain a self-regulated balance. When yin and yang are in harmony, energy flows in its natural cycle, life force is nourished, and healing happens. Body, mind, and emotions intertransform. Their chi comes together and disperses. It changes nature between material and ethereal substance, always working as one integrated whole. If something affects this balance, the harmony is disrupted and susceptibility to disease will occur. The entire natural world participates in this balance. The air that we breathe, the water we drink, the food that we eat, the emotions that we feel, and the things that we do or don't do. In most cases, if we intervene early enough, we can use simple lifestyle adjustments, herbal remedies, exercise, or bodywork techniques to rectify the imbalance. Let's quickly flash back to ancient Greece. Thales of Melitos, one of the seven wise men of antiquity, said, He also put forward the hypothesis that the originating principle of nature was a single material substance, water. Water is life. It's the foundation of all living processes. In Eastern medicine, water is the beginning of the cosmological cycle, the yin and yang cycle, the foundation of all the other elements. It's the element of maximum yin. It sinks to the deepest place and stores power and potential for growth. By element, we mean the basic constituent of nature, but also the qualities and characteristics of natural phenomena, the functions, movements, phases, or processes that pertain to that element. Water contains properties that are both yin and yang. It can be still or rapid, nurturing and healing, or turbulent and destructive. These properties are in opposition, interdependent, and intertransformational. One of the primary characteristics of water is change. Water yields to the form that enters it and at the same time encompasses that form and becomes that form. In turn, it encourages that form to become like water, to flow and change and move. Change and movement are the driving force of the universe and the smallest shift on any level can cause an avalanche of change. This applies to the macrocosm and to the microcosm, to the group and to the individual, to the body and to every cell. Blockage at any point in a natural cycle can damage the entire system that it operates in. When a person is immersed in warm water, the water becomes the catalyst for change. It provides an environment in which blockage and obstruction of a natural pr process is prompted to shift and the natural flow be restored. We use multidimensional stretching, acupressure, massage, and soft tissue manipulation to accomplish a healthy cycle of energy flow for the body's processes. This is why over, above, over and above the healing properties of water, they allow the body and mind a time out to repair and process. The bodywork techniques in water also give an extra nudge to the processes that would naturally take a lot longer to occur. Change and healing is therefore more likely and can happen much faster. But water must also cycle through other elements to manifest growth and change, become yang, fire, and return to water. Enter the five element theory. Water creates wood to become fire, fire creates earth and metal to become water, in the human body, each element has yin and yang organs associated with it. Yin organs are solid, nourishing, powerhouses, and have an upward thrust in the movement of qi, 
So kidney, liver, heart, spleen, lungs, those are all yin organs. The yang organs are hollow, transporting, and direct chi downwards. So urinary bladder, gallbladder, stomach, intestines are all yang organs. The visceral organs not only have a physical function, but are the centers that process and transform chi in its, to its various forms. Each form of chi has different qualities that correspond directly to the aspects of water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. And I think that's as much detail as we can explore today. The properties and relationships are far more complex than that, but we just need to know that each element has specific characteristics. More importantly, an intricate pattern of interrelationships and transformations exists between them. And these patterns are used as a model for the way in which the body's processes work and support each other. They're also used and applied to understanding disruptions in the flow within the system, which cause physical illness. So you may not understand this, but it's a simple map of how these processes work in the body. You don't have to understand it though. What I do want to highlight is that chi flows most superficially at the extremities and deepest at the visceral organs. This means that as therapists, we can access it best at the extremities. Reflexology techniques are based on this principle. Qi flows in a specific pattern through the yin and yang meridians of the body throughout the day and is dominant in each meridian of each element at different hours of the day. If I've lost you, don't worry. The only thing that's important to take away from this is that the primary principle behind Eastern medicine is to stimulate the body's own healing potential. The water element is its root and the powerhouse behind the stimulus. It facilitates the balance and well being of the human body. On, an in, on every level, the body recognizes this environment as safe. We all spent nine months in it. It calms the nervous system. We breathe out more deeply and let go. Its gentleness allows us to let go. But behind the gentleness is immense power, the power to drive change. And it goes deep into the strata of our being. When we incorporate this into a therapy session, we have a powerful tool that can trigger the body's own healing and long-term health. Okay, enough theory now. and Let's dive into the work itself. We all come in different shapes, sizes, and physical conditions. Water equalizes them all. Hydrotherapy is therefore suitable for almost anyone in any age group. It is an accessible, low threshold activity, and you don't have to be able to swim. It's great in addressing musculoskeletal conditions that present symptoms of pain or stiffness, and that would benefit from decompression and where movement or exercise is difficult or damaging on land. So spine, shoulder, hip girdle, knee and ankle conditions, arthroplasties and injuries, these all respond so well. We've seen particular success with shoulder patients suffering from adhesive capsulitis, and also with patients that have an imbalance between left and right sides. Then we have our chronic pain conditions and syndromes, fibromyalgia, RAOA, complex regional pain syndrome, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, Sjogren's, movement disorders, and other progressive genetic and degenerative conditions. For these patients, hydrotherapy helps them manage their symptoms and psychologically face what's happening today, knowing that tomorrow may be worse than today. Right, there are contraindications. So if you have any of the following, you shouldn't get into the pool to protect yourself and others. For this presentation, I've chosen the shoulder girdle and arm to demonstrate protocols and techniques, but they do apply for the whole body. A geron hydrotherapy session is all about economy and balance, achieving the most in the shortest period of time along the safest route without tr triggering setbacks along the way and sustaining the results. I balance the active and the passive work. So we usually have half an hour of remedial exercise and half an hour of body work. Intensive exercise needs intensive rest, yang and yin. 
Exercises are tailored to the specific needs and limits of the patient on the day. There are exceptions, but for most patients, this combination yields the best results. We start by creating an environment that's conducive to achieving the best results. So let's set the scene. The therapy pool must be private, indoors, well ventilated and heated to a temperature of 34 degrees centigrade. It's called thermoneutral. It's warm enough to ensure the body's core temperature stays within the normal range, especially for patients who can't generate body heat through exercise and it's cool enough to dissipate any heat from exercise. The body can stay in this temperature for extended periods of time and won't get too hot or too cold. Remember that water transfers its temperature into the body's tissues 25 times faster than air. If our body can't move well, we can't use exercise to warm up the tissues, but in a thermoneutral pool, we don't need a warm up. Tissues are heated almost instantly and primed for exercise and mobilization. Saves a lot of time. Economy. For pain conditions, this uniform warmth has a sedative effect on nociceptors and triggers an immediate relaxation response from the sympathetic nervous system, giving the body a window where pain sensitivity is less. This deepens breathing decreases guarding and reduces muscle spasticity. The warmth works with buoyancy to achieve better range of motion. It also makes patients more receptive to massage, stretching and body work when they're floating in a neutral position. And this helps release stiffness and improve mobility. It also works wonders on their mood and state of mind. Water quality is critical to keeping patients safe. 34 degrees can become a breeding ground for many unwanted strains of bacteria. In my experience, chlorine or bromine are the best sterilizing agents at this temperature and their levels must be monitored daily. Outside the pool, the bathrooms and changing areas need to be accessible, heated, and we've also put in a heated towel rail because even in summer, Coming out of the warm water, it gets chilly and we begin to lose some of the benefits of the session. The therapy session must be private and one-to-one -one, and the therapist must always be in the water with you. So even if you can't swim, you'll feel safe and are able to work correctly. The affected area must be completely immersed. This is important for a couple of reasons. First, to offload the joints and provide respite from gravity. Buoyancy is a powerful factor in alleviating the weight and impact that we feel when exercising on land. This gives us a window of freedom to correct movement and retrain muscle groups. Without gravity, we can work safely and at the right intensity. Secondly, heat transfer to all surrounding tissues. In a recent study published last year, Maria Grassa at the University of Porto in Portugal studied the impact of different factors of aquatic therapy as an intervention for painful shoulder disability. She found significant differences in kinematic parameters associated with different buoyancy conditions and that deep water promoted better alignment and bilateral symmetry on movement. We must take advantage of the freedom, warmth and weightlessness that the water provides so that we can achieve results. Once the area is completely immersed, we aim for perfect alignment, as perfect as possible, because sometimes restrictions don't allow for this at the outset. But because guarding is less and the tissues are more relaxed in the uniform warmth, the therapist can usually achieve this by manually stabilizing the affected area. In most chronic pain conditions, muscle patterning has changed so that correct alignment may feel completely wrong. Correct alignment is critical in activating the right muscles, stretching in the right way and retraining these patterns so that they are corrected on land. So it's very important to brace the alignment and guide the movement uh, until it can be performed correctly. Bilateral movement is also very important to achieving the balance that we want between left and right sides. They also work holistically to restore strength and natural alignment. 
exercises that involve alternating arm movements also help achieve symmetry of affected and unaffected sides. The water not only eliminates many of the restrictions that the patient experiences during land-based exercise, the therapist can also work with greater ease and efficiency. Correcting the form and guiding the movement is much easier because of the freedom and access we have to the affected area. It's quite effortless. No matter how tall or short the patient is, I can bring them to the level I want them so that I can work in front of my chest, my power center. I'm using my own chi and physical strength in a safe and efficient way, economy and balance. And then the movement becomes the medicine because it's correct. Here we use turbulence, the drag force that presents when you move through water. This is a useful tool because water currents test the mobility and stability of the patient. No joint can move in isolation, and this real reveals important information to the therapist. As soon as the patient begins to move, the body starts to tell its story. It quickly reveals the root of the problem. Then we find the I can zone, the zone that's pain free. You see the water allows for movements that are usually larger and less painful than in air. So the neural pathways are laid for I can. And this is important both physically and psychologically. Once we find the I can zone, we work hard and we do this by manipulating speed. The water's viscosity and hydrostatic pressure together achieve three-dimensional resistance and pressure on movement. It pushes back at you just as hard as you push forward. This means movements are slower and more fluid and you're challenged in more numerous and functional planes. Slow movements are wonderful for stabilizing joints and gently retraining muscle patterns. This creates a workout for the injured tissue that is both safe and that the patient is in complete control of simply by controlling the speed. It meets them exactly where they need to be met on the day. If they double the speed, they quadruple the resistance. And this figure compounds exponentially. Ben will expand on this later. Sometimes movements are assisted because the patterns are such that the tissues need a reminder on how to work correctly. But for the most part, movement is resisted. Remember that resistance is always in the opposite direction of movement. It means that when performing a circular movement, the resistance is also circular. For complex joints like the shoulder, it's hugely important and beneficial, especially for proprioception. We respect the limits and range of strength um, and pain, um, but challenge just enough so that post-treatment if inflammation is kept low and the next time we work, we are stronger and can achieve more. On this point, we need to be careful of the sedative effect of warm water on the nociceptors because especially with arthritic patients, they've been limited on land and get very happy in the water. So they go overboard with their movement and they can't move the next day. So we rein them in and ensure they're working safely. On the other side of the spectrum for athletes, the fact that the water needs, meets you where you need to be met in terms of strength, range and endurance means that you can really fine tune the relevant exercises which will enable them to return to full performance without sustaining further injury. If we need more space to work underwater, we create it. And if necessary, we use equipment such as fins or weights to increase resistance so that the patient is challenged on the day. I love the way that we can work with agonist and antagonist in the same exercise. The water resists both one way and the other, so beneficial and effective to balance strength and regain normal patterning. This is difficult to do on land and it saves so much time. Something unique to this form of hydrotherapy is dynamic palpation. I have beautiful access to release muscles while they're at work. Because of the perfect alternating balance between working and resting tissue, it responds so quickly to palpation and becomes more elastic as the exercise progresses. And then we stretch. Again, I'm pedantic about correct alignment. So the therapist usually braces the area to ensure correct movement throughout. Stretches are passive, where the patient is always in control of their stretch. 
This is important because guarding is less and relaxation is deeper. Here we prompt deep breathing, specifically a deep exhale for a deeper stretch. The buoyancy allows for easy correction, the warmth and relaxation response for greater elasticity. Stretching is a very important part of shiatsu. When animals stretch, they fully inhabit their body, prime their tissues for optimal performance and stimulate the flow of chi. After the acts of work comes intensive rest. We float the patient with special floats under the head and under the legs, in this case also on the arms, and ensure that no muscle groups are, at all are engaged and the body is neutralized in the correct alignment. We designed a head pillow that provides this perfect neutral alignment. It can be adjusted and can be used for all ages, head sizes and neck lengths. While floating, just as we ensured the correct form of an exercise in the active work, I'd like to stress that the correct alignment of the body in float is critical to achieve the results that we want. The more the patient relaxes, the greater access the therapist has to the body's tissues, the better the results. While floating, the patient also hears the most beautiful sound in the world, his own heartbeat. The warm water and the thump of your heartbeat helps you to return to yourself, to let go and disengage every single muscle in your body. In this deep state of relaxation, the mind is calmer, we let go of our preoccupations and are reminded that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We are much more than our diagnosis or injury, however overwhelming and encompassing our condition has become. Some patients describe this as a womb-like experience. Others say it's the best thing since outer space. It's about letting go. When we let go, we float. We are carried. We submit to gentleness. This is the key to unlocking the power of the water, the power of our own healing. Nothing else is required of us. We just float. We inhabit the present. We become like water. The therapist is now able to access the body three-dimensionally and can work with relatively little effort to apply specialized bodywork techniques which massage and mobilize in ways almost impossible on land. This is Sujak. It's a Korean hand and foot reflexology technique that is based on the principle that the whole body and its chi is mapped out and most accessible in the extremities. We use this technique to prime the affected area before actually working on it because it's far more receptive to body work for having been primed. The hand is also the most public part of a person's anatomy. Patients are quite comfortable with having a hand or a foot touched first. Once primed, they relax into the floating and massage, and we can then move on to other bodywork techniques. Here, I'm able to access the whole body, but specifically the affected area three-dimensionally with relatively little effort and apply massage, mobilization, gentle traction, and stretching. The whole purpose is to release tight tissue and restore the balance that we're looking for in the shortest possible time. I can work from any angle that I need to without straining my own body. Again, notice how I'm, how I'm working within the scope of my power center, just like in martial arts or Tai Chi. In Shiatsu, we use what is called a mother hand. This is the calming, still, supportive hand that counterbalances the, the hand that is working and provides a platform for the other hand to work effectively. There is also very little joint strain on the therapist. Water is about transparency and so much is revealed about the body when it's floating suspended in the water. I love the transparency. I can then get to work to address the issue, observing the limits of range, pain and pressure so that we achieve the relaxation and release that will bring about the balance that we're looking for. Once we have applied the various bodywork techniques, we stretch. In shiatsu, stretching releases blockages in our meridians, much like stretching a long balloon filled with water so that the flow of chi is stimulated. Breathing deeply in and out during stretches is very important. 
on a deep out breath, muscle holding and contraction is much less and the stretch is more effective. The affected area is worked and stretched last. This is because throughout the session, we build up to this and culminate in very gently testing range and elasticity. Because floating in warm water affects our consciousness and sense of boundary, our body feels more and more boundless. As a result, we can achieve deeper stretches. In cases where the patient has been referred and can't swim or has her water phobia, we ensure that they receive the support that they need to feel safe. This usually means that they hold onto a bar during exercise and body work, but this doesn't necessarily affect the quality of the session. Going with the flow is part of this type of work. There is a distinct structure in the protocols that we apply, but within it, there is lots of room for creativity and improvisation. The technique has evolved to effectively address a range of physical conditions where there are symptoms of pain or stiffness. The results are visible and measurable and lasting. On so many other levels, I'm filled with awe and appreciation of the element that most people take for granted every day. It brings us back to ourselves, our true essence, our true inner power. It's like going back to the beginning, our real home, the source of life itself so gentle but so powerful and boy can those effects be beautiful and lasting and I'd like to end off with a story this is probably one of the most precious things I own I picked it up off the sea floor free diving in Lemnos it looked like some kind of shell on the way home I saw my dad chatting to a friend of his I joined them and put down my treasures and the friend asked if I knew what it was. I said a strange looking shell. He explained that it was the spout of an ancient oil lamp. Judging from the black glaze on the interior and the worm tubes, it most likely dated to the fourth or sixth to sixth century BC. And that's over two and a half thousand years. Suddenly holding it felt very different. Someone who lived thousands of years ago had held this and now it's in my hands. It's quite profound. It reminded me just how insignificant and transient we are, but also how connected we are physically through time. It was like a baton being passed to me and I felt a tremendous responsibility to make things better for those who follow. We still use oil lamps today. They just look a bit different and they work better. The same applies for hydrotherapy. It's been around for forever. Its fundamentals are the same it has, and it has endured through time, but today it looks different and works better. I took the best of everything I had learned, spent many years trying and testing and learning some more and following what works. And the funny thing about working with the water and I deliberately use the word with, is just when you think you've arrived, arrived at a technique, a solution, it draws you towards something new, more refined, more effective. You've never arrived. And just when you think you've got it, you've mastered something, it proves you wrong. Sometimes I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. It's quite humbling. To this moment, it's still teaching me, creating with me. And that in itself is a lesson. To quote my ancient Greek ancestor, all I know is that I know nothing and that's a sign of wisdom. When we let go of our ego, we can really contribute to creating something for the well-being of the whole. And it's constantly being refined, not just by me. We're all connected and when we collaborate, learn from each other, become like water in its transparency, equality, safety, and creativity, we raise each other and the whole. We established a hydrotherapy special interest group in January last year to network within the field. It now falls under the umbrella of its university's Institute for Sports and Health. If you're interested in offering hydrotherapy, the group is there to share knowledge, techniques, and offer the support that you need. It is interdisciplinary and we learn so much from each other. 
Hydrotherapy does not belong to one healthcare profession. You can be an occupational therapist, an osteopath, a Pilates instructor, or a psychologist. As long as you stay within the scope of your qualifications, you can assist people that need it with hydrotherapy. We currently have these professions in the group. You'll find more on the Facebook page, Hydrotherapy SA, and on the WISH website, I'm sure. So there you have it, a technique founded on ancient and enduring principles, powered by my ancient Greek DNA, and born and grown in Africa, my home. Its effectiveness has been lauded by leading doctors, specialists, and wellness professionals, so much so that one third of our patient base are doctors, wellness professionals, and their families. I hope that you enjoyed this glimpse of my world and that you stay curious about the most beautiful and fascinating life form on earth, the human being. Maria, thank you so much uh, for that journey through um, your experience. Um, we really do appreciate you taking your time and, and and, and spending this time preparing this presentation and talking to us this evening. It was really fascinating to watch. Um, you can see your passion coming through. I particularly liked um, the flow through which you um, spoke through your presentation. So thank you very much um, for giving us your, uh, of your time like that. We're going to move directly on. Such a pleasure, thanks Robin. <laughs> thank you, Maria. We're gonna move um, directly on to our next speaker. Please remember everyone that uh, you can address questions in the Q&A. Um, introducing our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ben Waller. Um, he is speaking to us this evening from Finland, but um, he is actually from the UK. Ben is the clinical director of Good Boost Wellness in the UK. They're a social enterprise providing AI solutions to musculoskeletal problems delivered in community settings and homes. Ben studied his PhD in the effects of aquatic resistance training on the biochemical composition of cartilage and early knee osteoarthritis at the University of, a word that I cannot say. Ben is currently an adjunct professor at Reykjavik University in Iceland, where they are committed to doing high level research into the exercise physiology of aquatic exercise. Ben's passion is to champion the role of aquatic exercises in health promotion and management, specifically in people with chronic condition. Ben works clinically with a range of clients from elite Finnish athletes to people with chronic pain. So moving from hydrotherapy across to Ben with a bit of um, a specific condition that can be helped by hydrotherapy. Ben, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen and can you hear me well? Yes, very well, thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank Maria for inviting me which, and, and Robin for, for managing this, this webinar. It's a, it's a privilege to be asked to speak to such a, a large audience and a knowledgeable audience. I'd like to also thank Maria for a fantastic presentation just now. So a little bit about me is that I am currently the clinical director for Goodness, Good Boost Wellness. In the UK, I'm a, a lecturer at, uh, at the Yamk Applied University in Uvascula here in Finland. I'm a adjunct professor at Reykjavik University, and I'm also the scientific chair for the Finnish Sports Physiotherapy Association. So I do quite a lot of mixed bag of clinical research and also implementation of, of research. And I have a, a long clinical background, um, mainly in aquatic therapy, I'm a senior lecturer for the Aquatic Therapy Faculty, which is based in, in, in Switzerland. I'm a Badgaz educator. And as, as Robin said, I am the, um, I trained, I did my PhD in the University of Uvascular here in Finland. And that focused on osteoarthritis and the effect of aquatic exercise on the biochemical composition of cartilage. So we discussed what I would speak about today and we're gonna focus on on that aspect of, of aquatic exercise on cartilage and in especially the early stages of, of the disease. So I'd like to declare that I have some conflicts of interests, no financial from the research that I'm presenting, 
but I am probably slightly biased towards my own work and I have a strong bias towards the health benefits of exercise in, in chronic diseases as well as preventing them. So bear that in mind as you, as you hear my presentation. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about cartilage, exercise and cartilage health, and then we'll go through the stages of the OA continuum starting from early um, aspects of the st stage of osteoarthritis. So that includes patient, people who are at risk of getting osteoarthritis, athletes, etc. And then we'll move on to looking at um, how we would maybe manage people at risk of uh, getting more progressive uh, symptoms or worsening our symptoms from osteoarthritis and then look a little bit at what the aquatic exercise and the evidence says about um, exercise in, in established osteoarthritis. So we, we generally look at that as the pre-op stage of, of the condition where we, where they've got more severe symptoms. So if we think a little bit about articular cartilage, what is it? Well, it's generally talked about as being annual, avascular, slow to um, regenerate. Once it's injured, it's injured for good, etc. And there's this quite a negative view of what articular cartilage is. But if we think about its role in the body, the body you know, is there to transfer forces between two joints, two bones. So in the knee, for example, is there to allow smooth, resistance-free movements of the joint. And we need to think a little bit about its composition. What is it? So you've got the different layers of cartilage. You've got the superficial layer, which is that slidey layer that allows the smooth movements. And then you've got the, the main deep layer, which makes it up of um, these collagen fibers that go vertically up, they turn down and they come back down. Inside that, they've got the uh, proteoglycans, which are the things that attract water into the, into the um, cartilage. And this gives it its spongy, and um, resilience to, to movement. So it attracts the water, holds the water into those, um, uh, into, into the extracellular matrix, and that gives it its resilience. And we know that in the in cartilage, there is one cell that produces and maintains the health of the cartilage, and that is a chondrocyte. And the chondrocyte lives in a nice little bag, pericellular cellular matrix. It's a little bag uh, where the um, fibers around it attach to the surface of the, of the chondrocyte and through movement, osmotic pressure, changes in the, in, in the, in the cartilage create shear forces which then stimulate the cartilage, which then allows the production of, of the new extracellular matrix and maintains the health of the cartilage. And nine out of 10 of these receptors are actually mechanoreceptors. They're not, well, there is, so it responds to movement. That's how it maintains its health. And it's exposed to lots of different uh, forces, there's shear forces, osmotic forces, hydrostatic forces, compression, tensile strength, etc. So it's really important to know that as a tissue, it has to withstand an awful large variety of different forces which makes it actually quite a special little little tissue. Right? You know, it's very under underrespected in many cases. You know, you think about football players, rugby players, etc. What do they end up losing or ending their career for? It's it's cartilage damage. It's the joint no longer maintains the forces. It can't do its job. It's not necessarily uh, a muscular injury. So a lot of these um, athletes that we're seeing now are are at risk of osteoarthritis and at risk of ending their careers due to, due to injuries to cartilage. But the, the difficulty we have had with cartilage, especially is that you can't see, you can't touch it, you can't move it. You can with fascia, Maria just showed very nicely how you can manipulate the, cartilage, the, the fascia. But cartilage in itself is deep down, we can't see it, we can't take samples from it. So there's been that difficulty in, in, in researching it and it gets, it's, it's had quite a bad name really. But if you actually think about the new MRI methods that you can use, the quantitative magnetic resonant imaging, where you can actually start quantifying the health of the cartilage. Now, I use two in my, in my research. I use the degeneric method, which looks at those glycoaminoglycans, so those wisps that attract the water and keep the water pressure inside there. And then you look at the T2 relaxation, which looks at the quality of the, of the collagen, the alignment of that collagen. So is it strong? How dense is that collagen? Because we know that cartilage itself, when it improves, it's not like a muscle that gets big and bulky because that wouldn't be very genetically great if you've got 
if you trained a lot and the cartilage got thicker and thicker and thicker and it would you know limit the movement but so it it, it builds its its resilience internally and you can measure it with these qmi methods so that's what i used and this is something that's quite worth thinking about and looking at so if we think about how cartilage adapts and this is the same as any tissue in the body you load it it gets stronger you take load off it gets weaker that is how it works and quite commonly we thought that cartilage in itself doesn't respond greatly too much um, loading it changed it's, it's very slow to respond it's a neural it's a vascular but actually recent studies have shown quite an early response to changes you can see changes from a squat on cartilage using qmi techniques so there's instantaneous changes to loading in the cartilage and if we think about the effects on, on cartilage, when you load it, you increase the gag concentration, you increase into an extent the thickness, but that's only very minor. And actually there is debate about how accurately you can measure the thickness changes. There's an increase in bound water cartilage, and that's very important because if it's loose and it's wild, then it's not doing its job to maintain the, the, the structure of the cartilage. And you increase the collagen synthesis. And some even studies, even in 2014 showed that those people who are physically active, those elite athletes that are physically active, have higher gag concentrations in the cartilage than people who are sedentary or moderately active. And recently, we also showed that in people who are at risk of hip and knee osteoarthritis, that those people that increase their physical activity over one year, they increase their gag concentration in their knee cartilage. But there is that thought that too much movement, you'll wear your joint out, you won't be able to you know, you've only got so many movements of your joint until, until your cartilage is gone. And that is true in some of the um, animal studies where they used beagles, but the beagles had to walk and run on the treadmill for, I think it was 15 hours every day for six days a week. And there were young dogs with immature cartilage. So they're going to wear out, they're going to do an extreme loading and not this kind of progressive loading that we would do with, with athletes. So. We thought at the University of Vascular that what if we get a group of people with, with mild knee osteoarthritis, people who are at risk of doing of getting a progression of the, uh, the uh, osteoarthritis, and also who had risks of osteoporosis? Because you, there's a contraindication. If somebody's got OA, can you get them jumping to improve their, 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 car, their, their bone traits? So my colleague, Johanny Moltenen, the Armour Collie led by uh, Ari Heinonen did a study where they took a group of women with knee, uh, mild knee osteoarthritis and got them to do aerobics and plyometric exercises and jumping for one year, two to three times a week, and to see what happens to the cartilage. So they used these QMRI methods. And what they actually showed was that there was no change in the weight bearing areas. And the only area that saw improvements or potential improvements, in, in other words, in changes in the T2 measurements were in the patella cartilage. So actually long-term training didn't seem to cause any negative effects to the structure of the cartilage. And then recently there's been studies where you've looked at ultra marathon runners and ultra races where you're doing 4,486 kilometers. And they took an MRI scan along with them during that period, that, 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 that um, competition. And what they saw was in the ankle cartilage, there was an immediate response in the cartilage during the first phase of the running for the first, was it 1,500 kilometers or so? And there seemed to be a, a negative change to the cartilage, but then over the rest of the period of the cut of the run, it started to come back down to normal, as you can see in this graph, which is suggestive that yes, it responds to sudden loading, just like any other, uh, the other tissue, but then it adapts. So, you know, there is, there is some argument about the role of, of, of exercise and the fears of, car, of, of um, cartilage loss. And if you look at some of the articles about symptomatic or asymptomatic people and looking at their cartilage, there's, there's many chondral defects, many um, asymptomatic um, cartilage changes. So we really need to start thinking a little bit more carefully about how we look at the cartilage and how is its role. And there was some work done by um, a, uh, Dr. Bricker from uh, University of South Denmark, um, and they did a lot of research into, is air exercise safe for people with um, early stage osteoarthritis in 
cellular levels, animal levels, etc. And they found in their series of systematic reviews, there was no risk to the cartilage or for exercise. So it seems to suggest that even if you've got early onset osteoarthritis, exercise is not harmful. We have to move away from this wear and tear idea of, of osteoarthritis. But there are cases when um, you get the joint condition worsens to the point where they get constant pain, there's loss of function. And osteoarthritis as a condition is very expensive. In the UK alone, there are 8.5 million people with knee and hip osteoarthritis, and it costs up to 3.4 billion pounds of lost working days alone, plus the huge number of hip and knee replacements. So it is a problem. So what do we do? How do we, how can we get knowing that people with maybe at risk of onset of osteoarthritis, how do we get them to, or do we prevent them from progressing to this stage or how can we manage them? So obviously we, we know that osteoarthritis is associated with aging. Aging in itself doesn't cause osteoarthritis, but we see there's a sudden increase in the prevalence of osteoarthritis as you increase to about 55 years and onwards. But also there is that group that get the early onset um, osteoarthritis as shown here we've got the people that the athletes that picked up ACL injuries and um, meniscus injuries and they've got a higher risk of early onset uh, knee, knee OA. So we need to think okay osteoarthritis in itself is a progressive condition when does it start does it start actually earlier and if you think about the continuum, which was presented by Rawls and Arden in 2016, there is this continuum where you get the onset, but you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't measure it. And maybe slightly later on with MRI scans, you can. And then as you progress into early osteoarthritis, you can start measuring that loss of collagen. You can start seeing the reduction in the number of gags. But if we know that by training and exercising, you could actually improve the health of the cartilage, possibly just possibly we could either slow down the progression to that late onset or let stage osteoarthritis. So there's something to start thinking about that where do we line up? And now traditionally aquatic exercise is okay. We, we use it when all else fails. Early stage is not really where we use aquatic exercise. We use aquatic exercise when nothing else works with somebody with severe pain. And I want to challenge that idea. Um, we also know that hip osteoarthritis is slightly different in the osteoarthritis, but there are now growing evidence to suggest that even in the early stages of a, a child's career in sport, in, in, as a 12-year-old where they're training football, as, as, as the work by Palmer at Ella from Oxford University showed that um, the changes on, on the, of the cam of the, of the, and bony changes as related to loading during exercise start when they're about 12 or 13 years old in boys. And that then, although it doesn't necessarily increase directly the risk of having FAI or labelled tears, there is an association there. And as you progress further on, the risk of old hip and knee osteoarthritis increases. So we need to think about the osteoarthritis continuum as something that starts when we're training our young athletes, what can we do to manage the load correctly so that you can um, maybe reduce the risk of, of later um, joint problems. Now, this is a video that I like. I hopefully it's showing quite nicely to you guys, but there's, if you think about when an ACL injury occurs, such as here on an outstretched arm with, with extreme forces and a sudden rupture of the ACL, and quite often you focus on the ACL injury itself. We have to remember that during the incidence of getting an ACL injury, the forces are sudden high and there are huge compression forces within, especially in these cases, the lateral side of the, of the knee. So these are all really quite um, important things to consider especially when we think that an ACL injury is a risk factor for later stage knee osteoarthritis. So is it down to our management that they could get a further risk of OA or is it due to um, the biomechanical changes due to having to have surgery changes in the ACL? I think this is still an area that we're, 
we're looking in. But if you think about post-injury MRIs, et cetera, normal MRIs, you quite often get something that looks like this, where you've got quite nice, smooth looking cartilage. The ACL is ruptured, yes, but you know, the medial and lateral um, cartilage looks quite nice, but on, the, on, on one view, you can see uh, a bone bruise. And if we then look at this actual image through a quantitative MRIs, you can actually see that this red area in the cartilage here is changes in the biochemical, in the bio, in the, in the biochemical composition of the, of the cartilage. This is a bruise in the cartilage that you can't see. This is superficial, yes, top third, but top half, and it's the same in the medial. And in fact, the medial is much wider. So you can see that these ACL injuries themselves also cause cartilage injuries, but we focus primarily on the rehabilitation of the, of the uh, ligament. And what we kind of suggest is that you, you know, injuries occur, you get the inflammatory process going on in the early stage. So how can we support this healing process with aquatic exercise and what do I do? So theoretically now we've gone through this line to know that aquatic exercise can, can um, improve the, or exercise has an effect on cartilage health. You can train cartilage. We also know that when you pick up an injury, it doesn't necessarily mean you get knee OA. So we need to think about how we can do this. And I'll give you just a case study of a, a athlete who picked up an ACL that we treated conservatively. So he, picked, he um, had an ACL injury, um, very similar to the other image that I showed with a bone, bony, bony bruise, clear compression on the, on, on the, in the bone, but the radiologist's view was that there's no, 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 no cartilage damage there. So I'm uh, talking to him and, and having a word with him, he was saying that there's a lot of um, joint stiffness, a lot of OA type symptoms early on. So we decided to take him into the water. And so he was a swimmer. So naturally the water was his environment, but, and we decided to treat him conservatively. So we spent a lot of time doing very um, high intensity training, but had low impact on the, on the joint itself mainly through um, contralateral activations. And then we had a lot more high intensities later on after month one, and then much more high training, high intensity training after that. So this is how we managed him. And this is kind of like the exercises that I generally try to do early on in a, in a rehabilitation process. So this is using the um, crossover effect on the, so his left leg is the actually affected leg. And we're actually trying to train strength or get activity in the unaffected leg, right leg, while stabilizing on the affected leg. And so we tried its different movements. And initially, when he would train with the affected leg, we would use a slightly smaller fin, but I always would use a fin in the early stages due to the sensation of the of the water, the joint proprioception, you need the extra resistance. We've done some research on that as well to show that. If you just gently move a joint through the water, you're not going to get any stimulus to the sensory motor system or cortex. So you need to have that resistance to get that stimulus. So that's the kind of stuff that we would do early on. We just increase the intensity as part of his training process. And I allowed a lot of mistakes, a lot of um, learning to balance. I didn't correct him in saying you need to be in this position, not that position. I wanted him to relearn and control that. And after 11 months, he returned back to full swimming competitions. And he had no instability and played football. Eventually he had another injury and had another ACL, had actually had the replacement, but for several years he managed quite nicely without the, without the surgery. And what, I, what there is growing evidence is to suggest is that that movement in the joint of the active non-impact training at early stage of ACLs injury could be a good support for the healing of the cartilage. So there was a study by, on some mice and rat models where they took the ACL out and then they used either put them in the water for a lot of the time or they were on the land just moving around normally. And those who were in the water seemed to have better maintenance of the cartilage health and less loss of cartilage at six and 12 weeks after, after the, the, the um, surgery. So there was some suggestion that that non-impact training also had some supportive effects to the healing.
Now, I like to say that when you work with athletes and for many people, and especially now with people who are now sedentary due to COVID, deloading has a negative effect on cartilage. Cartilage responds immensely quickly to deloading as well as loading. And so when you have somebody who's got an Achilles tendon injury, for example, there was evidence to show that the ability of the cartilage to withstand forces can decrease by up to 75% after that, that period of, of um, fixation. And in some cases, the QMRI methods that we use show that it actually doesn't respond and return back to normal even after longer periods of, of remobilization. So also I use the pool very often to either maintain mobility during cartilage healing, during post-cartilage surgery, at that early stage to get some movement. We know movement is anti-inflammatory in the joint. We know it's anti-inflammatory in the muscle. So we try to keep as much going as we can because we know that if you do not move, there is a possibility that you do not restore the cartilage resilience. So some of the options that I use you know, I, I, I combine them, but I generally try to get the athletes in the pool moving as, as much as the joint allows, even if they're injured or not, to get something going. It's also the psychological aspect. And as Maria showed earlier, that you can do some really good work, not just for the physical aspects, but for the psychological. You know, these athletes have picked up an injury. They are devastated. They don't know whether they're going to get back. And so by having a uh, training in an environment that manages all those aspects is, is very important. And then my interest was the, is what actually happens if you train with aquatic resistance training in the water. So you do, um, you use those kind of movements, those kind of fins in the water to load the cartilage in the knee. So we go from that high loading impact training that we did with Johanny Maltin's research to the project I worked on with, with Matty Munoka and uh, led by a, a Hainan in it. And we did an RCT to look at the effect of three times a week, high intensity of aquatic resistance training on knee cartilage in people or women with, with mild knee osteoarthritis. So we use the same methods for QMRI. We use a lot of met our other outcome measures. We got 87 women with mild knee osteoarthritis, randomized them into two groups, a control group, we just did usual care, and then the intervention group. And this was our training. So they would train as hard and fast as possible. If you're going to get something that completely contrasts to what Maria just talked about, it's my training and this training I do with these um, with, with this population. And in fact, this actual training program, five different movements has been used in many different researches by Tapani Pohanen, Anu Valdonen, and there's some unpublished to show um, data that people who are pre-operative, just pre-operative can train really hard in the water and get very good benefits. So this training program is one of the most researched therapeutic training programs in, in aquatic exercise. And what we found was well, surprise, surprise, there was no effects on the cartilage post-training on the weight bearing region. Even though they were doing four to 800 repetitions of knee flexion extension during a training session. What we did find was there were small changes in, in T2 and in the degenerate, but there were contrasts in each other. So there showed to be improvements in T2 and there seemed to be some slight negative effect in the degenerate. But when you look at the size of these changes, they're well within the measurement, uh, possible measurement error. So there is, there is a possibility this is just a subsequent finding due to, due to measurement, but there was a small change in that posterior area. But what we did find was that that intensive, high intensive aquatic exercise training had a significant D effect on body composition. So it was a huge over four months, I would say a huge decrease in fat mass. So 1.4 to 1.5 kilos of fat loss during three or four months training, which compared to other interventions in this population is, is, is high. The only problem was that the participants after, after the training went back to their usual physical activity after 12 months and, and, and lost all the benefits. You can see this graph here that the physical activity during the training periods up high up here, but when they went back at 12 months, they were back down to their usual levels of physical activity. 
and all the baseline, all the baseline measurements returned, or any improvements that we saw returned to baseline, except the ability to walk two kilometers. So we found that the walking speed over two kilometers increased significantly in the training group at four months after, at immediately after the intervention. But then that also stayed at 12 months follow up. And we asked ourselves, is this down to biomechanical changes? Well, it wasn't down to improved fat um, strength. It wasn't down to changes in pain. It wasn't down to changes in perceived function. But what we did find was that the people were saying that they believed they could push themselves harder. They could train harder. And actually they found it difficult to find people willing to push them that hard in public training sessions, in public pools, et cetera. They were, everybody was being too like, oh, you've got knee pain, you're gonna wear your, your knee out. Well, actually they were looking for that hard training and they wanted that hard training. And, and this is important to know that if you can really push people with hip and knee osteoarthritis hard, but the research sounds to suggest we don't do that. The recent systematic review by myself um, looked at, at people with hip and knee osteoarthritis and found there was no significant changes in, in muscle strength, small slight changes in functional tests, but nowhere near the same size as on land. And that was reproduced by um, Sophie Hayward from Australia, who did a systematic review on aquatic exercise for muscle strength, et cetera, in people with different MSK conditions and showed exactly the same, that our training wasn't improving objective measures of function and physical performance measures. But when you looked at the training methods, they were pretty light. In fact, I would say they looked pretty passive. And when you watch and think about osteoarthritis, people try to be a bit gentle, but don't be gentle because the cartilage doesn't want you to be gentle. The cartilage wants you to load it because if you don't load it beyond the usual loading systems that you have during daily activities, you're not going to get optimal benefit in the cartilage and also in the function of that person. We know that the health benefits of the cardiovascular training. In our training of the people with hip and knee, with the knee osteoarthritis, we were pushing them to maximum heart rates about on, in the water. When we measured them on land, we looked at what the estimated maximum heart rate would be. And when they're in water, they were reaching very close to that that maximum and they're training Borg 18 during that half an hour. And they loved it. They wanted more of it. So I think aquatic exercise as a whole should look a little bit more like this than, than, than this, quite frankly. And I think this is something that we need to really, we love, the water is great for, for many aspects, but when you're treating an M, people with MSK conditions who are generally typically inactive, less active than they could be, you need to push them. You need to get those cardiovascular improvements. You need to get those general inflammatory, um, low-grade inflammatory under control. You need to get the muscles working, the joints working, and you do that by active training. And like I say, I'm a bit biased on this, but I've done research on aquatic exercise, um, deep water running, and, and you can reach high levels of intensity. We've reached maximum VO2s with deep water running with elite athletes in the pool, there are huge benefits to do it. And it is a, a wonderful way of doing it. It's a gentle way of doing it, but it's still hard. So I spent my PhD trying to look at all this stuff, thinking that I'm gonna change the world. And I found that my research, all the research I did in the world, didn't change how people are, are actually using aquatic exercise, getting access to aquatic exercise, as you saw previously. Um, a lot of aquatic therapies provided in specialist pools, but there are pools everywhere, public pools everywhere. And I got approached by um, a colleague, um, Ben Wilkins, who is the CEO of Good Boost, and he asked me to come in and, and work with him to implement research and implement the knowledge we have on, on exercise and aquatic exercise on people with chronic MSAK conditions. So I started working with him about a year to almost two years ago now, and we now provide a service for um, people in wanting to do aquatic exercise, AI controlled, looking at the implementation of, of this research. We, for some reason, we actually now have, uh, and consequently we have a, a, some association now with, with, with South Africa, South Africa Swimming. So, you know, you might see us about, we are a, a, a community enterprise. We are looking to develop 
scalable re ways of, uh, of using the evidence we have for aquatic exercise in, and get it accessible to, to the large numbers in, the, in public pools. I would also like to take the chance to quickly mention that we do run a series of webinars as well for aquatic research through the International Aquatic Therapy Faculty. And that's something to just keep your eyes open. Um, the next one is, is, is in a few month, weeks time with, with Harrier and, and uh, Professor Sato talking about the central nervous system changes during aquatic exercise. So to summarize, that um, any injury that causes trauma or changes in joint load, it will have a direct effect on cartilage health. Rehabilitation protocols should take into account the healing and reloading of affected cartilage and taking off the load for extensive periods of times is not the way to do it. There is need for more clinically usable methods in identifying post-traumatic cartilage changes, and this is a constant problem that we have. But the clinical symptoms of, of joint stiffness after rest is, is a cardinal sign, even with young athletes where they've got cartilage-related injuries that don't really associate nicely with the soft tissues injuries that they have. And in anybody with, with hip and knee osteoarthritis, the early aquatic exercise should be a facilitator to better self-efficacy and improve resilience to load and increase the ability for them to maintain a healthy way of life. Thank you. Ben, thank you very much for that presentation. It was very interesting to see a lot of your research um, that you have done and that you've looked at. Um, thank you for leaving your um, contact details up there. If, if people have direct questions to you, I'd like to encourage them to, to contact you. Ben, what I see from your presentation and from the way you um, do things with aquatic exercise, it looks quite intense. And I think that came across quite a lot. And it seems to be contradictory um, to Maria's uh, technique that we heard about earlier. So, so what are the types of um, injuries or the types of conditions that you think would benefit mostly from the aquatic exercise um, type of approach? So, I mean, if you look at the benefits of exercise as such with, with chronic diseases, there's a huge body of evidence that land exercise will be beneficial. I don't think there's many situations where it won't be beneficial. There will be, um, I do like to think that um, we should be approaching a aquatic exercise earlier in the rehabilitation process and not considering it a last resort. I think there's a lot of people that don't want to go into the gym and it should be considered as an, another alternative to training. There is, the research shows that there's no additional benefit for aquatic exercise over land training. But if, you're not, if you don't want to do the land training, you do the aquatic training. But I think especially when you've got an, um, an inflammatory process and early acute injury, going from light training to more intensive training progressively has benefits. So again, uh, you know, I, I do highlight the, the, the ligament injuries and I do highlight the bony injuries in endurance athletes where, where I've mostly worked with. Great, thank you. I'd like to bring Maria in back there again. Um, if Maria can um, turn on her screen and um, uh, talk to us, I'd like to ask her um, opinion about the level of exercise that you're seeing in Ben's type of approach versus what appeared to be very relaxed and very therapeutic type of approach um, in your technique, Maria? Well, firstly, congratulations, Ben. Wonderful presentation. Very interesting and very interesting in its conclusions. And uh, yeah, I don't think that they're contradictory, Robin. I think that um, in terms of the uh, the type of uh, balance that I like to use in the active work, we're talking about meeting that patient where they need to be met. So pushing to that limit, well, trying not to overstep the limit. Sometimes you don't know where that is, but, but, but pushing for um, uh, the, the strength and endurance that you want in the active work but then balancing it out at the end of the session with intensive rest so that you, you uh, reduce the inflammatory response and, and allow for that uh, 
tensile release from the exercise. So, so I, I don't think that we're contradicting each other. I think that there's there's definitely a place for intensive exercise. Um, but I also like to stress the intensive rest. Okay. So, yeah. so what it sounds like to me is that it's, it's really a continuum and you need to find right. your patient somewhere on that continuum and use the water mm -hmm. and the exercise within the water to, to assist that. Correct. Okay, great. Um, I'd just like to add to yeah. that is that is it, it depends on your treatment goals. Where are you trying to load the system? What, what, what's the outcome? You know, my goals are always to improve cardiovascular fitness, muscle strength, neuromuscular control, you know, and expose the, the, the different areas to big loads. But I do know that there's athletes that need exactly what Maria talks about is the big rest, take off that load, take off that tension to allow them to, to, to come, calm down and actually get to a different level. So I don't, I don't see them contradicting each other, but they do have different treatment goals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Uh, Maria, there's in the, in the Q&A tab, there's been a couple of um, questions about COVID-19 and, and access to you and the close proximity, et cetera. Um, have yes. you taken any special precautions during this time? Of course, Robin, yeah. So uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, we're implementing more stringent distancing and hygiene measures. Um, fortunately, uh, the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S., uh, quite early in, in April, um, stated that uh, correct chlorination of heated pools renders COVID-19 virus inactive. So it's safe to go for hydro as long as the pool uses chlorine or bromine as a sterilizer. Um, that's what they green lighted. Um, I'm sure that hydrogen peroxide is also safe, but we don't have that in black and white. Um, so we chlorinating religiously and maintaining chlorine levels at over two parts per million. Um, only one patient is allowed in the facility at a time. We schedule time in between patients for thorough disinfection and uh, they are sanitized on entry and are required to wear a mask at all times. Um, the pool equipment is also and the floors, surfaces, railings, door handles, changing areas they all regularly sanitized with either 70% alcohol or bleach solution. For the equipment, it must be a bleach solution of over 1000 ppm. Um, yeah, it's we, yeah. we're really experiencing unprecedented times and okay. have what, to take the measures that we, we need. What you're saying is that under the correct measures, then it's still safe to continue. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Yeah. Um, something that I wanted to touch on quickly, we don't have much time, but Maria, you encouraged the fact that a, a therapist was with you in the pool all the time. It appears that Ben encourages a bit of um, an ability to do it in one's own place. Um, so can you talk us through the, the different approaches? Can one do a program like this given to me by a therapist or um, a, an, someone trained in exercise? Um, at sports and exercise medicine, and can I do it by myself? In terms of my program, you mean? Yes, yeah. So, so Ben, your program, it appears that you can do that sort of program by yourself. Absolutely, and that's 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 the benefit. I do do the one-to-one -one treatment, the Bagdad's ring method, but I am looking at at the moment how to push aquatic exercise to the masses, and the one-to-one -one, it has it's got its its limitations in the number of people you can treat with it. So, you know. I do do the one-to-one, -one, but I, I, I do champion the, the ability to go to the pool whenever you want and train as hard as you can, as you want. Okay, so using that more as a training sort of um, exercise, whereas Maria's is, is more of a, a therapy one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, type of situation. Yeah, so the, the, what I'm concerned about, Robin, is very often, as I said in my presentation, sometimes, especially in the chronic pain conditions, the patient's perception of normal movement is okay. completely yeah. wrong. And they're triggering that, especially with adhesive capsulitis, for example, you know, you, you think that you're moving correctly and you, you, when you're trying to reach something high, but instead of lifting with your arm, you're lifting with the shoulder. And, and that actually perpetuates the incorrect muscle patterning. 
Um, and, and what you want to do is break that patterning. And that's why uh, in terms of the, the stability of or stabilizing the joint for them, almost teaching them to use it in firing with the correct muscles. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's the, the, the principle that I follow. Um, but if I'm not concerned that they're going to do the exercise incorrectly on their own, then I can give them a program to do on their own okay. in their own pool or at a gym and then they can do that in their own time. But if I do have a concern that they're doing it incorrectly, then I think it's it's very important that the therapist is is, is kind of in control of that movement. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, one final question uh, before we close. I come from a pediatric background. And so Maria and, and Ben, do you see any specific conditions um, related to pediatrics? One that jumps to mind, um, in my mind, is cerebral palsy, and I'm sure hydrotherapy has got a big role to play there. Yes, a uh, number of cerebral palsy children and also traumatic head injury. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so musculoskeletal and, and where there is symptoms of, of either pain or stiffness, but musculoskeletal issues where then we stimulate the child with play exercises, uh, different uh, type of sensory uh, tools that we have as well. So uh, sometimes lighting, sometimes um, play toys that they play with. So it, it's it's an interesting approach to pediatric. I didn't touch on pediatric today because it's just beyond the scope of the presentation, yeah. but there is a lot that you can do. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, what's clear is that uh, there's there's a lot of scope to this. There's a lot more information um, that is out there that can be accessed. So uh, Maria, can you remind us of where we can um, access the, the WISH special, special interest group? I believe hang that on. was on Facebook. Uh, yes, hang on. I'm just going. Can I quickly share my screen again, if that's okay? Absolutely, uh, sure. Hang on. I just. Uh, Great. I actually didn't scroll through my references, first of all, and okay. then these contact details. And the last Facebook handle is the. Um, the Hydrotherapy Association on Facebook, but uh, the WISH website should also have the, the special interest group. Fantastic, thank you very much for that. So uh, we saw Ben's contact details and there are uh, Maria's contact details. Um, it leaves me at this point, um, we've come to the end of our session and it leaves me to thank our speakers. Thank you very much for the time and effort that you put into this. Uh, we Such a really pleasure, thank you. Um, it's fascinating. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Maria. And it's left to me to advertise our next webinar. So our next webinar is happening in two weeks' time. Um, and that date you can see there is Wednesday, the 18th of November. It is at 7 o'clock. So not 6 o'clock. It's at 7 o'clock. And we're talking about slap tear injuries of the shoulder. And we've got a specialist radiologist who's going to be talking about some of those injuries um, uh, that's, and, and showing us some images, et cetera. And we can discuss that in detail. So if you take your phone and you uh, open your camera app and you put it over that QR code, you should be able to register for the we next webinar in two weeks time, Wednesday the 18th at seven o'clock. Um, there's also a link to ensure that we've captured your details for CPD points. As always, thank you. Um, to our um, colleagues at SASMA for promoting this. Um, thank you to our team at WISH um, Social Media and Nadine who ensure that um, CPD points um, go out, CPD certificates. Please um, just bear with us. It does take some time um, for you to get those certificates. So never fear, they will be coming. And a final word of thanks to our sponsors, Asino Lita Pharmaceutical Company. Thank you as always for um, giving us the opportunity to host these webinars. So with that, uh, we look forward to you joining us in a couple more weeks and thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.